try to squeeze time for study. Sometimes, you know, like I got frustrated because I couldn't make the perfect condition for me to focus. So I just, I'm just really frustrated with that. And I have a um, registered exam in, in June. And I know in June, July, I can try the paper one. And then after that, it's online version. That's fine because I, I, I'm with, I think I signed up with the Can Academy for the um, online, you know, testing. Mm -hmm. That's great, right. So like I'm getting familiar with the, um, um, like the platform. Um, but just like really a lot of things going on. And I can't really know uh, what's the best way for me to focus um, 100% and know I'm, I'm making progress. Um, I don't want to, you know, like I take like timed um, exams, like five sections, five whole sections every week on the, on the weekend day. But I just don't want to do oh, this week I do better, next week I do worse. And then, you know, like, I, I don't know, like, if I'm improving or just, like, randomly I score better this week and then maybe it will change later. I want kind of to to, to have a, like, stable idea. Oh, I'm really increasing my score steadily. Even if it's little, like, small progress, I'm still, like, sure I can, I'm doing better but not fluctuating, you know what I mean? Like, So what's the trend right now? Right now are they just fluctuating up and down? Yeah. Yeah, that's that's very common. I, I can definitely relate. I was in the oh, really? yeah. I was in the same situation back when I was studying and it was the most frustrating thing in the world. I know because sometimes I, I, I do online one. It's a little bit from paper, but I mean it's just it's it's easy. Um because if you do paper, sometimes you are not honest with yourself, right? You give a little bit more time or whatever. But online is like, you know, when the time is up, it's up. If you didn't choose answers, just it's empty, right? So it's more like a true fluctuation. Uh, like, yeah, sometimes they score 160 and sometimes 151, 152. I'm like, dude, how can I do better before? And now I'm studying more than previous, but I'm scoring poor, poorly more like worse scores i don't get it so yeah well let me ask you this lynn what's your review process like aside from doing these full length five section timed exams each week what else are you doing in terms of reviewing those exams afterwards um i just review why i got it wrong sometimes like it's more like a, a misread information whatever um, but you know, sometimes some answers, I don't get it why it is chosen that way. So I would search, um, like the power score, those kind of forums to, and then Manhattan, like, you know, like if you Google that, we'll come up with, with the answers and I will go through their strategies and then their interpretation to see, oh, that's why this is correct, but not a hundred percent, um, convinced all the time. So. So okay. My strategy, r really, just do um, you know, like test and then review. <laughs> well, like, what can I do else, right? I did prep test before, so I I know what they are teaching. It's just really like think about it. If you do like a intro, even though it's not in, it's not called intro, like a prep course. Sometimes it's like usually a month and a half long, right? And then two or three times a week and then go through the strategies and then practice sometimes in the class. And after that, they give you a lot of more materials for you to practice. I've been doing that, <laughs> you know? Like it's just, it's not going well, I think, yeah. So it sounds like you're doing a lot of the things that you should be doing, but believe yes. it or not, there is still yet more to be doing. The LSAT requires more of us than we could have ever possibly imagined up to this point. Now, I read about your background. I saw that you have the dual bachelors, you have the masters, you got accepted to the PhD program. So you've, you've been able to jump through a lot of hoops up to this point, right? And that's impressive. Uh, oh, thank you. Oh, you went to Columbia, right? I, my ex-boyfriend went to Columbia. So like, I know you guys are like, really smart so um well i think it's about working hard too though and i think that you've been able to jump through a lot of hoops up to this point and so it makes sense that you might expect that the lsat will require similar now you mentioned that 
I just want to unpack a little bit of what you said because there were a few things in there I think are worth talking okay. about. One of them is that you said that the program is a month and a half, the, like the, some test prep course meeting a few nights a week. And that, that's great. That, that's definitely valuable. But the reason that prep courses are structured for that timeline is because that's what most students are willing to do. And that's what it's economical to offer. But you need a lot more than a month and a half or even two months or three months to achieve your fullest potential. It took me an entire year to get from the low 150s to a 175. And I'm not saying it should take you that long to reach your goals, but five to six months is perfectly reasonable to devote to this given the importance of the LSAT. Then the other thing you said about reviewing wrong answers, looking at explanations, that's valuable, but there's still another entire additional side to it, which is reviewing everything you get right, but have difficulty with. And then beyond looking at other people's written perfect explanations from the experts, you should also want to engage in your own personal introspective review process where you look at what led you to pick or consider the tempting wrong answer and what discouraged you or pushed you away from the right answer. Actually writing this out by hand or typing it or explaining it to a friend or a tutor or someone like that. Have you done anything along those lines? No, I don't think anyone is studying outside. Like really, my friends, they're working. So, well, they may studying for CFA, <laughs> but not outside. So like really, I don't have anyone. Well, here, here's an idea for you then. Uh, so you, you're, you're lucky you have friends because not everybody studying for the LSAT has friends. It's easy to get into your own bubble with this stuff. But you, so you have friends and your friends also studying for an exam, the CFA which I understand is a, a quite difficult exam as well. Yeah, yeah. So what if you set up an arrangement with your friend where they have to listen to you babble about the LSAT for a half hour, then you listen to them talk about CFA for a half hour as you kind of balance it out and you explain things to each other. And maybe you don't care about CFA and they don't care about LSAT and that's fine. But there is something magical about speaking these things out loud. You don't truly understand something until you can explain it to somebody else in your own words. The common pitfall with reading perfect explanations online is that these people have all the time in the world to write them and perfect them. And they also have typically a decade or more of experience like I do, right? So when you look at my explanations or watch my explanations, I've been doing this for a long time. And I also have the liberty to take all the time I want to create the, ex uh, the explanation, whereas you're taking a timed section or a timed exam and obviously you haven't been doing this for nearly as long. So you see the difference there? Yeah. Yeah. But sometimes, you know, I, well, I work for a time nine to five, Monday to Friday, right? So even though I'm willing to put more um, time into studying and so sometimes I have other commitment, I just need to like take care of other stuff too, but that's fine. It's just like, you know, if I have three hours each day after work and then sometimes you do three or four logical games and then re you reveal them, three hours passed, you know what I mean? So, so I can't just, I cannot do a large amount of practice within um, limited times and then, and, I, I really want to go through every question, but sometimes I just have difficulty like wrapping them all up before being prepared to write an exam. Um, and, 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 and I think a logic game is fine. Like, you know, there's no exactly like ambiguous answers because which is right is right, right? So like, but I mean, for reading comprehension, just, I, I think I'm really bad at that. I, I don't know, like, is there any strategy for me to quickly improve that or like this is like really difficult because sometimes if I don't get it you know like if it's not making sense to me I freak out and my my mind just phrase like phrase like I just can't read it and I just like choose randomly that happened to me when I was doing my GRE but you know like GRE is not on the same level as I'll say that. I know you wrote a book about, you know, if you're ESL and then um, this is a book for you to, to, to do dive into um, reading comprehension. I'm thinking about buying that book and also maybe some other books that can help with my strategy. So if I, 
if I'm doing questions, I'm reviewing, and also there's some other additional explanations for me to to reflect. So, I yeah, so I'm just yeah. saying a lot. So yeah. No, so. great. I'll I'll try to address every single point I can I can remember that you said. Yeah. It's all it's all useful here. I think that definitely if you're a non-native speaker then I created that resource, the Vocabulary Builder, specifically for students in your situation, dealing with difficult LSAT vocabulary that's also troubling for native speakers too, but words that are used in uncommon ways and the LSAT has its own particular vocabulary, its own particular language. Like the word, yeah. like the word phenomenon, for example, is used in a strange way on the LSAT compared to mm -hmm. everyday speech. So th that's a resource mm -hmm. I think would, would certainly be valuable for you. Again, okay. I, of course, I have LSAT practice explanations on my side as well, and there are another resource if you want to get another take on things. But I think that what you want to first do is what I said, what I laid out about the review process on your end. Now, you mentioned uh, you that that's the first step. You do your engage in your own review process, and only mm -hmm. then look to the outside explanations written by others like myself. You don't want to use explanations as a crutch because it's too easy to look at uh, and say. Oh yeah, I get it now. I see why it was. Yeah, that's, how yes. can I be so dumb? That sort of thing. It's very easy to gloss over it, but then in two minutes you're done with the question, but you didn't really learn it in sufficient depth because then mm -hmm. next exam next week you might make the very same mistake again. Mm -hmm. So and you said, well, how do I have time to do all this review? I wouldn't have as much time to do LSAT practice problems, and that's a very common, a uh, very common uh, concern I hear from students. Yeah. But but yeah. the, and I understand it because you want to maintain your schedule. You want to take maybe one or two timed exams per week. And you also have your other obligations. I know you said that you're doing maybe 10, 15 hours a week for LSAT. So yes, it would mean that you could not do as many practice problems if you devoted more time to your review process. But I think that's a trade-off worth making. Obviously, you don't have unlimited time. Nobody does. Mm -hmm. But the value in doing these exams is not simply to measure your progress and have more time sittings. The real value is in learning from your mistakes. What particular tricks and traps are you falling for? Because LSAC has thousands of them because language is complex, language is limitless. And you're not falling for all of those mistakes. I saw you're doing quite well already. You're in the high 150s and around 160, right? So that's a- Sometimes lower. Sometimes lower, yeah. But you, you well, reached at you least know. up to a 160. That's a great position to be in, especially for a non-native speaker. There are plenty of native speakers who would kill for that. So you're doing well, you're doing better than a lot of folks already. You're you're certainly did, sorry about that. Do they just enter the outside game or whatever? Like I think, well, like well, I think my average like maybe mid hundred and fifty. That's my average. Sometimes lower than some higher. You know, sometimes it goes up. I'm like, what? Are you kidding me? Like, can I really score that high? <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a, there's a couple of things there. I mean, one of them is that there's actually, it's totally normal for scores to fluctuate. There is a margin of error or a score band of three and a half points on either end, meaning that if your true score that you deserve innately is, let's say, a 155, let's say that's where you are at in your ability, because there's that margin of error, because it's a standardized test, it's not, it's not totally 100% foolproof, right? There's, a, there's randomness involved. So one day... Mm -hmm you might get a 158 or a 159. The next day you could get a 152 or a 151 even, but mm -hmm. your still true score is 155. So fluctuating is totally normal. There's that range okay. of, that's an, there's an entire range of seven points there, which means that the funny thing is that let's say you walk in on test day and you score a 155. You have reason to retake, even if you didn't improve your understanding at all between let's say June and July, a five, six week gap. Because due to randomness alone, you could get a 158 or a 159. And yeah, you might do worse. I agree. Schools don't average. So yeah. there's always a reason to retake if you are not already at the highest end of your score band. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. But you know, my goal is not unrealistic. I think for me, like 163, 165, I would be really happy if, you know, I reach that goal, I would not retake. Because I... Well, I've been working up to graduation, so by the time I got admitted, hopefully in the future, I'll be a mature student. So, like, it's another, like, you know, it's lower than if you're going straight from your 
bachelor's law school. So um, because the, the school I work for, we have our own law school programs. I consulted with them. Uh, yeah, 160 is fine. You know, like I don't have an unrealistic goal. I just want to reach that. Great, great. Then I'd say the biggest thing for you is really simply to double down on your review process, reduce the number of practice problems you're completing, and instead spend more time on the review process. And if you're scoring even in around a 155 or even lower, that means you've got a good 20, 25, 30 questions you might be answering incorrectly. And then maybe there's another 10 that you guessed on and got lucky on. So that could mean there are up to 30 or 40 questions per prep test that you should be reviewing. And to review 30 or 40 questions, that could easily take three, four, five hours or yeah. longer, right? Yeah, so yeah. It could take longer than actually doing the exam itself first time around. And people never want to spend that long. And I get it because it's grueling. It's not fun. This yeah. is, but this, this is the work. Like this is where the growth comes from. Sitting oh. doing a timed exam and working through problems, that is actually, it, that's hard also. And that, that'll fry your brain too. But that is actually easier than the review process because the review process, there's not necessarily a hard limit on how long that can take. And that's forcing you to grapple with nothing but the problems that gave you trouble. There's no break with doing like an easy logic game that you could breeze through, right? So if, you, if this takes you a couple of days to get through all the work on that one exam, that's worth it. That is where the growth comes from. And another thing you can do is you can flag every question that gives you trouble in the moment. And then before you score it, you could reattempt it under untimed conditions and see how your performance might vary between attempt number one and attempt number two to give yourself a second chance to see if the yeah. time issue or if the understanding is the issue. So yeah, review is the biggest thing. And I think that's where you want to spend some more time than you currently are. I have some questions. First of all, um, if I'm doing one time session uh, for exam each week, and um, for the rest of the hours, in addition to reviewing, do you suggest me to take unlimited time to solve every problem or also do timed practice? There's a benefit to both doing untimed work and timed work. You might consider if you identify a particular weak area, like a certain type of logical reasoning question, or reading comprehension, like you mentioned, you could just do an untimed reading comprehension section to increase your familiarity. You could do, let's say you have trouble with parallel questions or necessary assumption questions. You could do a couple dozen of those in a row. And of course, if you're not doing an individual section, then your work really should be untimed because you can't time individual LR questions in isolation. There's a benefit to doing untimed, there's a benefit to doing time. But I think that a mix of it, all of it's good. It's, it's, it's really all good. I wouldn't obsess too much over the details, but if you want a structured plan, I do have day-by-day -day study plans on my site where I break down specifically what to do every single day over the course of your prep if you want that specificity. But honestly, given where you are right now, I don't think that's necessarily what you need. I think you might just need to do a timed exam each week, lots of detail, you like devote an entire day to that, or at least four to five hours overall, and then over the rest of the week, you could do a time section here, a couple dozen questions there, untimed, but it's, it's all valuable for you. Just make sure you review everything that gives you trouble. Okay, so if I do self-review but I still don't understand, what should I do? Uh, sometimes I Google and in the forum, the explanation then, you know, sometimes it's interesting, like power score and then like whatever, like Manhattan or other people's forums, those are sometimes they're contradictory to each other. Like really, you know, you understand what I'm saying? Like, especially um, in terms of reading comprehension, some people would uh, think, oh, the last paragraph is, you know, implying in this, and then the other person totally get a different idea. But it's really frustrating because that is supposed to help you understand the structure um, of the passage, right? If those people, they're experts, they're not, you know, consistent with each other. How can we know? That's a great question. If you look at the third source, hey, they might tell you something different altogether. So yeah. there's a couple of options. One is to pick one source and stick with it. But of course you want to know who's actually right. And so if, you, if you're working with a, a coach or a tutor, someone you trust, then you could go to them. And if you trust them above the random things you read on the forums, 
that might be a good way to resolve it. But also consider that there are often multiple ways to derive a correct answer. That could be true for games, like one person's logic games diagram might look very different from another person's logic games diagram. And then, and then for reading comprehension, it's yeah. possible that support for the correct answer could come from multiple parts of the passage. So maybe That's one true. person says they got support for correct, the correct answer from line 17, another person got their support from line 53. And they could yeah. both be right. There could, because sometimes the passages repeat themselves a little bit. So I would, oh. I would consider that also. But again, only look at the explanations after you've puzzled through it on your own. I think if you still aren't getting it, then of course, go outside of your own mind, go to another source online, for example. Mm -hmm. Okay. Another question is uh, for reading comprehension or sometimes um, like uh, the logics, not logic games. Um, sometimes the sentence is really long and then I don't get it just you know, and then I panic that, you know, I didn't get to understand that part. Do you have some resources to help people who are ESL can read long sentences with a very complicated structure more efficiently? So we don't panic, you know, like I, I think else that is a mind game. Like if you're afraid of it, you just, you can't do it. So... Yeah, I do have some resources, and it certainly is a mind game. They, the reading comprehension passages in particular, they're not quoted from the real world. They are not simply excerpts from a particular journal or newspaper article. They are rewritten and reworked by LSAC to be more boring, more dense, more complex, yeah. more confusing. You see, you can look at this. You can see for each exam, they, they tell you the source material, like a bibliography of works cited where they adapted the content from. I have one article on my site where I actually compare the two, the original source article and the LSAT passage, and of course they're very different. So mm. I do have resources for this. Yeah, I read that article. Yeah. Oh, awesome, yeah, the New right. York Times book. Your block, yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly, and you saw how much worse the LSAT one is, right? Yeah, but you know, I just want something, you know, like maybe after certain practice, and then when I read a passage, I oh, I'm like, I, I can have like a assurance, okay, I kind of get it, you know, but sometimes if I do uh, reading comprehension, even after I read everything, I'm just like, what is that? You know what I mean? Like then that's a point when I freak out and then when I look at the questions, I need to go back and read again. And then, you know, you think about time past, just, it's really like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's there's more than just question explanations. Like I get the sense that you're doing these passages, then you're looking at explanations, but the explanations are more granular or specific to the particular question at hand. They're not giving you necessarily an overarching strategy or technique to approach from the beginning. They're telling you why the right answer is right, why the wrong ones are wrong. Yeah. But you also have to look back towards the beginning, your basics, your foundation. So you asked if I have resources, including for non-native speakers. Yes, I do, actually. I work with a lot of non-native speakers, speakers, and so I've actually crafted a several, several different videos on my YouTube channel specifically for non-native speakers. If you go to my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash LSAT blog, you'll mm -hmm. see there's a reading comprehension playlist, and I recorded probably 10 or so videos. I, I sat down for a couple of weeks and just recorded a bunch of videos exclusively on reading comprehension for non-native speakers, dealing with some techniques that you could use in particular. So I'd okay. suggest after this call, take a look at those. Mm -hmm. So what do you suggest me doing, like based on your assessment of what I'm going through? I want some like a structured plan or whatever, just helps me to reduce my anxiety of this upcoming exam. Like really. <laughs> So you mentioned both June and July. Which one are you registered for? June. Okay, so you've got about a month and a half till then. Yeah. I think your plan to do one timed exam per week, five sections is good. On top okay. of that, you, and I, if you can, ideally, I'd say increase it from what you're doing right now, which is 10 to 15 hours per week. Okay. I think ideally you want to do at least 20, given, given your goals and given you know, being a non-native speaker. That is, that is tougher. That is a, another obstacle, and you just have to work harder. There's no... I know magic way around that and also yeah. that reading comprehension is harder to improve on than the others because it's less mathematical there's more of the ambiguities of language so one time exam a week 
detailed review of that exam. The timed exam, five sections, might take you about three hours. The detailed review yeah. might take you five hours. So that's already eight hours, but we still want you doing a couple of timed sections during the week. So I'd maybe do two timed reading comp sections and two untimed reading comp sections, then um, a couple dozen logical reasoning questions of the types that give you difficulty. Uh, like, yeah, strengths and the weekend and assignments. Yeah. Yeah, and of course, review everything you do that gives you trouble, not only what you get right, but also whatever gives you difficulty that maybe you could have solved more efficiently, or maybe there, you, get, you guessed and got lucky. So flag okay. that you're unsure of so that you can check later if you got it right through luck or not, because that's, of course, there's still value to be gained from that. I also want you to look at my YouTube videos I mentioned on reading comprehension specifically. Mm -hmm. And for your explanations, that, that you're, for your own review process, don't necessarily write out explanations or articulate explanations for every single question you get wrong, because that might take too long. Yeah. But maybe handpick the biggest five or 10 questions per exam that give you trouble and either write out your explanations by hand in a notebook and mm -hmm. keep a running log of everything that's ever given you trouble so you can return to it in a couple of weeks. You, okay. could type, you could type it out. I've had students who create Word, like Google Docs. They create a separate document with all their mistakes and articulating their thought processes. And then the last thing I would say is talk to your friend studying for the CFA and create some sort of study arrangement where you talk to each other. And if not that, of course, you could find study buddies online. There's lots of different, I have a Facebook group, facebook.com slash groups slash plugged. Yeah. So you could check that out. People can organize study groups in there. And there, of course, there yeah. are online forums too. Okay. Do you have like a, based on what you suggest me to like one time whole session and then two timed and then two not time reading comprehension or other like questions, do you kind of have some of the plan? Like a, you, you have, you know, schedules and plans, right? Do you have something similar to that so I can, cause, because I, I, I think you're, you're, you're expert in this. And then when you make plans, you think about easier and harder and, you know, like loops, right? So uh, do you have something like that so I can? Yeah, yeah, I do. I, I'd suggest go, go on my site, go to the day by day study plans. For you, since you're obviously not starting from scratch, I would suggest that for you, probably the, three month day by day study plan would be a good fit for you. And you can oh. adapt it. So the three month day by day plan will give you a, an overarching structure for your studying. You can of course skip the games portion of that because you've already done games and that's not your focus. You could jump ahead to the later stage of reading comprehension and just incorporate what I suggested here. You can oh, okay. modify kind of, adapt it for yourself. Okay, selectively choose the plan. Right. Plan. Okay, I see. Thank you so much. If I have more questions or I require like additional tutoring, I'll just send an email, right? Is if, if, yeah, if you're interested in, it's been a pleasure speaking with you, Lynn. If you have any interest in or feel like it would be helpful for you to explore one on one coaching with me in a more serious program, then mm -hmm. about, and we can definitely talk about it then. But I feel like you can get there with or without me. So only if you would like my help and feel that it would pave the way or smooth the way for you, then reach out and we can talk about going together for, for June or beyond. Yeah, I think for June and beyond will be more reason because now it's like a lot to do before the test. So who do you think that will need your help? Like, I don't know, like why you think I can do it without or with your help? Like, I don't get it. So can yeah, you- Yeah, sure. Well, you strike me as being someone who's highly motivated and disciplined and driven. And you, you've, like I said earlier, you've jumped through a lot of hoops. You got accepted to a prestigious PhD program. You have your master's, you're a non-native speaker, and you're taking on the difficult task of the LSAT. So, oh my goodness. It's so I, I, find it, I, find it, I find it quite inspiring. And I honestly, I do love working with students like yourself who inspire me. It's simply that I believe that you are hardworking enough and disciplined enough that you're capable of getting there on your own. The LSAT is a difficult task, of course, though. So if you would like my help, then of course, do some work on your end first, like we talked about, examine and peruse the resources I suggested. But then after reviewing those, if you would like my help, then of course you can get in touch with me and we can talk further. Yeah. And I'll just, you know, purchase some of your materials you prepared for people who study themselves. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Now, before we sign off, Lynn, just to wrap up, 
What would you say is the biggest insight that you got from our coaching conversation today? Uh, like details, like revealing is, um, is really worth your time than just simply do the questions and then try to explain yourself why you got the answer wrong and then before you look for other you know explanation because sometimes uh, we just get the answer wrong and directly look for online solutions. I think that's that's helpful and then good to know that you think I can do that myself and I, I don't really have that strong belief in myself but you know thank you very much that's that really helped you know mentally <laughs> of course my pleasure Lynn. And one, one thing I, I wanted to touch on because you mentioned stress you mentioned anxiety and the stakes involved in the LSAT I just want to remind you that while the LSAT is a very important exam of course no one particular LSAT test date is especially important you can always retake they're actually offering the LSAT more frequently now than ever before we mm -hmm. used to only four times a year now they're going to offer it nine or ten times a year going forward so you have ahead of you this year you have june july september october and november and then next yeah. year you have january and march also so there are many many test dates you could take the lsat and still apply in the same cycle so don't place too much importance on june in particular or july in particular there are always more opportunities ahead of you and since law schools do not average multiple lsat scores there's not really any problem if it doesn't go well for you one time you can always retake yeah, but uh, if you apply, the deadline is November, right? So if you already ask your people to write reference letter for you and in that year you didn't get in, well, you need to bother them again. Like, uh, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, well, I kind of want to, you know, prepare beforehand instead of bothering people to write multiple reference letters for me. Of that course, yeah, starting early is always good. Getting it done early is always good. But even November, let's say a school did have a deadline in November, that still leaves you June and July, September and October. Yeah, that's that's right. Well, luckily my supervisor supports me going to law school. So, well, at least I can have some, you know, security. So, yeah, but thank you very much. Um, do you mind emailing like the study plans you just mentioned? You think that will work best for me and also like non like ESO non native speaker, how to improve their of course, yeah, I'd be, I'd be happy to send you some resources, Len, definitely. Yeah, so I can, you know, when I do my own review, I can, you know, learn some strategies more efficiently. Yeah, of course. It'd be my pleasure. Yeah, thank you so much. Thanks for tuning into the show. Please subscribe if you haven't done so already to be notified of new episodes as I release them. And feel free to reach out if you need anything at all as you move forward with your prep. I'm happy to help however I can. In the meantime, I wish you all the best and take care.